Hello, I want to share with you uh, an interesting thing that happened this morning, April 16th, 2023. My family, my wife and uh, my youngest child, uh, who is 29 years old, and I were reading the scripture together. Uh, we try to do that every Sunday. And uh, the, the Lord often brings... Uh, new understanding and revelation to the scriptures when we do that. <clears throat> well, recently, I um, have been really provoked by a certain scripture. The last couple of days, it's uh, Revelation 19, verse 10, that says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In context, I'll read 9 and 10. And the angel said to me, write this. This is the angel that Jesus sent to John to reveal uh, the revelation. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow bondservant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now in the English Standard Version, they closed the parentheses at, uh, after he said, worship God, and they did not include the last phrase for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But I think that's what the angel said, and that would be included, should be included in the quotation marks. So <clears throat> I've really been uh, going over this for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, the English Standard Version reference edition has great references for um, verses. And so I have been looking up the uh, references to uh, that phrase, the testimony of Jesus. And I want to share um, some of those with you. I think um, probably the strongest one is from John chapter 19, where John describes the crucifixion. And he's very particular to go through the things that happened and tell you when a certain thing was the fulfillment of scripture. Um, for example, when Pilate finally decides to crucify Jesus because the Jews demand it, Pilate, it says in verse 19, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Don't write the king of the Jews, but rather write, This man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then <clears throat> he says, When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, his tunic was a seamless garment. That's prophetic of the Word of God. The Word of God is seamless. You, I can go anywhere in the Scripture and 
teach the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus gives um, his mother into the authority of John. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Then John says this, and this is verse 31 of chapter 19. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. What he's saying here, the day of preparation was the day of Passover. We just went through the day of Passover uh, a little over a week ago. And uh, last Sunday is what so many people call Easter, but that was the... um, the resurrection day, the day of the wave offering. Uh, And and that was during the um, Feast of Unleavened Bread. So when it says here that the Sabbath was a high day, that's because the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is to be a Sabbath according to the instructions God gave Moses in Exodus chapter 12. So because of that, I'll just start again reading so you understand the context. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. In other words, get them off the cross before nightfall, before evening came. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Now catch this, verse 35. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, quote, not one of his bones will be broken, close quote. And again, another scripture says, quote, they will look on him who they have pierced, close quote. So, we need to understand that the scriptures are written by witnesses to certain things. John was an eyewitness of the life and the death of Jesus. He saw the crucifixion. Then in John 21, this is very interesting. Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was resurrected. So at the very end of the book of John, chapter 21, verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper, and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, What is that to you? This is the disciple 
who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things and we know that his testimony is true. That's John. John is speaking about himself although he never uses his name. And finally he wrote this, verse 25. Now there are also many things, many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And so, also let's go to 1 John chapter 1. Here's how he, he starts. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So once again, John is bearing witness. He says, the things that we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. So, you know, some people doubt the reality of Jesus, and some people doubt the scriptures. But consider the teaching of these men. These men, like John, like Peter, like Paul, spoke of absolute righteousness and holiness before God. They are not the kind of men that would lie. There's no reason for them to lie. If they lied, everything that they said and stood for would be false, would be ridiculous. As Paul said, if we're believing in a hoax, then we are to be most pity, pitied among all men. They would not have lied about this. John saw Jesus live and die and saw him again after he was resurrected from the dead. That's the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what does it say in Revelation 19? The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we were reading the Bible, it, my son reads um, a psalm every uh, Sunday when we do this. He had just finished reading all of Proverbs and uh, now he's reading Psalms and we're at Psalm 2. We read He read Psalm 2 today. So when he finished, what I did, I went to the references in Psalm 2 that take you to other scriptures. And Psalm 2 is an amazing scripture. I want to read the whole thing. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against I am and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. We are seeing this in action by the leaders of the world right now. The nations are raging, the leaders are plotting, and they're plotting against God. And they've been doing it for centuries. They've hidden the truth of the earth from us, and they've tried to hide history from us. They've lied about everything because they have conspired against God. And they have done everything they can to keep people from turning to God. They love to do evil deeds. Verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. 
Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. I am said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve I am with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now this psalm is very interesting because it is quoted in the New Test- Testament quite a few times. And again, you know, get your reference edition of the English Standard Bible and, and then look at the references. Because see, what happened today was we simply began going to the references and we got into the testimony of Jesus. Psalm 2 is prophetic. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. For example, in verse 7, the references here Cited in Acts 13.33 and Hebrews 1.5 and Hebrews 5.5. 5. So let's go read now. Let's read Acts 13. And I'm going to read a lot of that, not just the, um, the one verse that is cited. Because we need the context and we need to see how this is the testimony of Jesus. So we'll start at verse 13 in chapter 13 of Acts. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and, motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm he led them out of it. And for about forty years he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when God had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me. One is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterance of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. I want to stop there just to briefly comment. Isn't it amazing? 
The scriptures were given by Jews to Jews, and yet they did not understand the scriptures. And because they did not understand the scriptures, they ended up fulfilling the scriptures by condemning Jesus to death. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news, the gospel, that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. So that's the scripture that my son read today from Psalm chapter 2. Looking at references, it took us to Acts chapter 13. And here in Acts chapter 13, we have Paul as a witness giving the testimony of Jesus Christ. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he says also in another psalm, You will not let your Holy One see corruption. And remember, John talked about that in his gospel. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. So there we had one of the references and then another reference is in Hebrews chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 5. So Hebrews 1, just beginning of the beginning. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son. Today I have become your father. So there was that reference from Psalm chapter 2. And then when you go to Hebrews 5, it begins with this, starting in verse 1. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself a glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, which happens to also be in a different psalm, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So, we had that reference You are my son. Today I have become your father. That occurs three times 
in the New Testament. And then we have another profound reference. Verse 9. Well, I'll read 8 too. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Well, that occurs several times, three times, in fact, in the book of Revelation. The first time is with reference to the church of Thyatira, and it has to do with God's overcomers. So he says this, verses uh, 26 and 27, The one who overcomes and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. So see, first of all, Jesus was given that authority according to the words of Psalm 2. But Jesus gives that authority to the overcomers as well. And then we go to Revelation chapter 12. Twelve one, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Then I'm going to skip a few verses and go back or go down to verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. Okay, that's three and a half years. And... It's exactly 1260 days, as you see in verse 6 above. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So, if you haven't listened to my videos on the God's judgments are increasing and the final plagues, Leland Earls, Prophet Leland Earls said in with regard to the fourth plague that that is going to be the manifestation of the sons of God according to Revelation chapter 12. When the woman who is the church gives birth to a male child, it's going to be the rapture or the glorification of 144,000 of the 144,000 overcomers. And those overcomers are going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Revelation 12.5, she gave birth to a male child, or a man-child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And then we go to Revelation chapter 19. 
19, it begins with the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then right after that, we have the angel talking to John who says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then right after that, it reads, verse 11, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and by the name, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. So here again, we see Psalm chapter 2 being fulfilled in prophecy, in a prophecy that has not yet occurred. The same being with respect to Revelation 12 and Revelation 2, because the overcomers have not yet been glorified. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and the riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. Well, isn't that interesting? Because, see, that ties right back to Psalm 2. Look how Psalm 2 begins. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Against I am and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So then we see in Revelation chapter 19, this great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains is describing all of these people who have conspired against their God, against the God of the universe. And then verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with silver, uh, sulfur. Well, what is that? They are thrown into the jurisdiction of the overcomers who will rule with a rod of iron. They're thrown alive into the lake of fire. The overcomers are the lake of fire. The overcomers are the ones who will rule with a rod of iron. They will rule with the righteousness, the justice, and also with the mercy of God. And these who have taken part, who have engineered, who have led the rebellion against God will be dealt with by the overcomers. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So does this mean that uh, Jesus is going to kill people with a literal sword from his mouth, coming from his mouth? Of course not. How are they slain? What is the sword? The sword is the word of God. They're slain when they finally believe, when they finally turn from their flesh, when they finally turn from the evil of their ways. That's how they're slain. So this is a picture of those who are alive and, and left at the beginning of the reign of Christ will be put into the jurisdiction and custody of the overcomers of God who will rule 
with a rod of iron. And that is the testimony of Jesus. And that came from Psalm chapter 2. So from the second Psalm, we went through the Bible, we went to Acts, we went to John, we went to the book of Revelation, to 1 John, and spoke the testimony of Jesus. That is the spirit of prophecy.